and I'm here to do a recap on our Wednesday live chat the chat that was put up on January 31st apparently the receiver that I was using with my mic was going in and out it wasn't working appropriately I have since checked another receiver and hopefully on our chat next week we shall be set while I have your attention the chat for next week will be on scrap storage want to know what size scraps do you save and how do you store your scraps and also even your scrap fabric per se like your larger pieces that are left over from yardage when you make a quilt top say you have an eighth of a yard or less tell me what do you do with that so we're going to talk about those particular things next week and I hope you can join me this topic on the batting was recommended by a YouTube viewer, HC, and she had a lot of questions about the use of batting, the selection of batting. And so I'll talk, I'm going to talk about a few things and then I'll come back and add her questions in. So the first thing, oh yes, and also this chat. And also in this chat, we also talked about quilting gills. Was it a positive or a negative thing? And so we'll get into that at the end of the discussion on the batting. Also, I don't claim to remember everything that was stated about the batting. So I am really doing just a recap of the chat. The chat was about an hour and 15 minutes. And I'm just trying to get this video out very quickly and from this point on i'm going to try not to edit the video and just let it go so if i have any bloopers in here please bear with me but i'm trying to get this video up as soon as possible so before you can even decide what type of batting you're going to buy there are some things you need to know about batting some particular characteristics one of them is batting size so you can buy batting in two ways you can either buy it prepackaged or you can buy it by the yard. When you buy it prepackaged, they come in different various sizes based on what they consider to be traditional bed sizes. So if you're buying a twin quilt batting, make sure that that twin quilt batting will fit your quilt. You may have to buy a queen. So when you buy your batting, you want to make sure that you have at least three to four inches around all four sides of your quilt. That means you want six to eight inches extra batting around your quilt top. And the reason for that is because as you're quilting your quilt, your batting is going to draw in. And the more denser you quilt, the more that batting is going to draw in. So you just want to make sure that you have enough. And also you don't want to stretch and tug and pull trying to make it fit an extra inch or two because you will have the regular consistency of that batting in the majority of your quilt and then in other places you will be it would be very thin so you don't want that either so the next thing is fiber content and so I have some samples here they're not the not very big but they're just the type of samples that I have they don't include every type of batting and so I'll talk about some where I don't have the actual batting so the bedding that I personally use the most is warm and natural and it's 100% cotton and I'll just show you the bat here and then if you look at it from the side this is the consistency so yeah and again it is 100% cotton it does make for a denser quilt and I like this because I do like to quilt my quilts densely. The yellow brick row quilt that's back there is actually quilted with a 100% cotton batting that didn't have a scrim. And warm and natural does have a scrim. And a scrim is when the batting, 100% cotton batting is put together on a scrim so that it can hold the fibers in place. Otherwise, it would just fall apart. 
And this quilt actually has the batting that does not have the scrim, 100% cotton, but it has to be quilted a quarter of an inch apart. You cannot quilt it eight inches and you wash it, it's all just going to crumble inside the quilt. So that's another thing about batting. When you choose your batting, you've got to watch your quilting consistency and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So warm and natural also does have a warm and white. So if you have a white quilt or a very light quilt and you don't want the shadow of the natural, then you can use the warm and white and their density is exactly the same. It's just that one has been bleached and the other one is not. Another type of batting that I use I saw it at Joann's. I bought a boat of it because it was at a reasonable price when they first came out. This is 100% cotton and the texture of it looks like it could be some polyester in it, but it is not. It's called the Toasty Cotton and I don't didn't know anything about it when I purchased it, but I do like this as well. It's 100% cotton as I said, but it also quilts up where it still have more softness than if you used a warm and natural quilt batting. And then you can get into your 80-20 bats, like your Hobbs 80-20, and they come in natural, and I only buy it in the black because I use the other battings throughout my quilting process. So I don't quilt for a lot of people, so I buy what I use, and then if somebody wants to purchase batting from me, I will tell them what I have and they can choose from that. But what I like is that Hobbs has an 80-20, and I like the consistency of how it quilts as well. And it still looks like it's the same depth as the warm and natural bats, but it will be a little more lightweight, kind of like the toasty, cotton that I got but I like using black batting when I have black background or a lot of dark colors in a quilt top like if I'm making a African style quilt or a quilt that has a lot of black in the sashings I will use a black batting and that's because it will beard batting beards you may not see it all the time but it actually beards and when you put a white batting or a natural batting under a black quilt and then you quilt it from all those needle penetrations, that batting will start to come out of the quilt and you will definitely see it on the back. But it just looks like it's pet or pet hair or something like that all over the quilt. So you have to be really careful with putting a light color batting in dark quilts. So I do it for my navy quilts, my black quilts, and sometimes my purple depending on how dark the purple is. So we have some other samples here. You have polyester bats. And this is a polyester bat and you can see that it's pretty poofy. And I'm showing you this because when you buy polyester bats, you need to look at the ounces. That's very important. This, this polyester bat is a 6.6 .6 ounce. I actually got this when I purchased my long arm system. Gamble gave me two of these in a package that I got from them. And I don't really like it, but I do use it a lot when I do charity quilts just so I can get rid of it. And if I want something like more of a Trapanto look, then I would use polyester batting as well. When I go into the four ounce batting, it's a whole lot smaller than that. And so you need to be careful as to what you are purchasing so that you will know that your quilt's not going to turn into quote unquote a comforter if you don't do a lot of heavy quilting. And the other thing about polyester is that before we said that you could not quilt polyester as much, but now the recommendation is to quilt it a little bit more because when it washes, it starts to pull when it's in the washing machine and dryer and so that it starts to knot up. It starts to raise, not up, and draw. So then they're recommending better quilting for that. And I will get those to you when we get there. So one other thing I forgot to tell you. When you do the bag batting, if you purchase your batting by the package, 
make sure that you put it into a dryer system so that you can get those folds out and when you put it into a dryer system in a dryer i don't know why i said system but when you put it into the dryer make sure you put like a damp cloth in there with it like a damp bed cloth and what that does is that small amount of moisture will take the folds out of the batting and you just want to fluff it you're not drying the batting you're just fluffing the batting so some other examples that i have here is fusible fleece which can also be used as batting i use this when i have small table runners that i know i'm not going to wash a lot or that i want to make sure they stay really flat and like my table runners as well so i like using fusible fleece and i just want to show you that even when you buy fusible fleece there's different thicknesses to that and for those that don't know fusible fleece has a fusible webbing that you can iron to your quilt top and then you can just stitch it down with your backing but this here is one weight and i'm hoping when i put the other one up that you can see the difference this one is a lot thinner i mean this one is a lot yes it's a lot thinner i'm sorry and when i put this one up i'm hoping you can see the difference but when i look at the packaging it doesn't say anything on here about any of the weights so when you're buying fusible fleece just make sure that you feel it to know if that's the texture and consistency that you're interested in for your particular project then i have one other batting and then we're going to talk about some that i don't have is i have a lot of people like the quilters quest drink i mean <laughs> so a lot of people like the dream cotton the quilters request batting and you can see it here and it comes packaged this is a, probably the only batting that i would buy packaged and this one is for queen and on here it says it's 108 by 93 so if you make your queen quilts say 96 by 96 or something in that neighborhood then you need to know that you're going to need to buy a king batting that's 122 inches by 120 so that was a good example of buying bats by the size you need to make sure you read the measurements so then you have other brands of so then there's other types of batting that you can use 70 percent cotton 30 percent polyester 60 percent cotton with 40 percent silky 100 percent wool 60 percent wool with polyester 60 percent wool with cotton you got your bamboo batting and it's so many different battings out there and i have not used those other battings that i have talked to you about but i know a lot of show quilters they love 100 percent wool batting a lot of them also love bamboo batting and to your surprise a lot of the show quilts might use two different bats they may have a cotton batting on the back and then they might have a polyester on top so that when they're wanting something to look like it's 3d on the quilt that polyester will come up and then they'll do dense quilting when they want to push that batting back so a lot of different things about batting one other thing is that there is a batting out that's the green bat and i'm blocking right now which company makes it uh, if i come across it i'll let you know it might be in my notes i'm not really sure okay i just messed up my project i'm preparing to sew next but um yeah i'm trying to make sure we got everything okay so if you're sewing on a home sewing machine you definitely do not want to use a high loft polyester matter of fact i would make sure that it's a very thin polyester or i would go ahead and use a 100 percent cotton or hops 80 20 and that's because the arm on your domestic sewing machine is not big enough to hold all of that batting if you're quilting a bed size quilt so you got to be careful about how much you're trying to put up under your machine arm as well when you're picking your batting
Okay. So let's talk about choosing batting for your needs. So you can go by the loft, which is the weight and thickness of the batting, whether it's thin, medium, or high. You can choose the price. A lot of people prefer polyester because it's cheaper than purchasing cotton. And then you can also go for warmth. A lot of people were using a lot of 100% cotton battings because of warmth. But now wool is in the market and it's actually the warmest. Followed by polyester and then cotton. And that's weird because you would think that cotton would be warmer than polyester. But cotton doesn't breathe. Cotton is breathable. So if you're, you know. So then... For warmth, according to statistics, wool is the warmest, then followed by polyester and then cotton. Cotton and wool breathe better than polyester, but for some reason, cotton batting is not as warm as polyester. So it says. Recommended quilting distances for quilting. So when you choose your bat, you need to keep these following things in mind. If you have a polyester batting, you want to quilt it two to four inches apart. If you have bamboo batting or warm and natural batting, then you can quilt up to eight inches apart. And then your wool batting needs to be quilted two to three inches apart. And that's to help take care of some of the draw up. One other thing about batting is that some people tend to be a brand they, they tend to be brand users which is basically what I am for the most part I stick with warm and natural but there you know if I have something else or if the quilt isn't as serious or if it's going to be a gift to somebody then I will use other bats as well it's just that I prefer to have cotton batting in my home so then some of the questions that I had from HC say is polyester batting okay and does it hold up as well as cotton? I've been making quilts since 1994. I use, I have used cotton battings. I have used cotton and polyester mix. And I have also used 100% cotton. And I've used various different types of those three types of batting. And I haven't had any of my quilts fall apart because of the batting that was inside. So no... You don't have to worry about the longevity of the quilt. I feel the quilt will last as long as one that has cotton batting in it. Her next question was, is it harder to quilt? I th actually think polyester batting is easier to quilt, especially if you're hand quilting, because the needle will go through the polyester a lot easier than the denser cotton because it has a scrim that's holding it in place. Now, the quilter's request batting is one of the battings that is recommended for hand quilters because they say the needle glides through like butter. So then it just depends on the particular batting that you buy. And then she says, what batting would you use for infant quilts? And that's where it's a very controversial because the whole issue is, is if an infant is caught in a fire, polyester batting tends to melt cotton batting will burn and so they're saying in the industry you know different various opinions when you look this up is that the polyester will melt on the baby's skin and then my take on that is at least it won't catch on fire whereas if you're in a 100 percent cotton it's going to burn and you can do a burn test yourself you can try burning something that's 100 percent polyester and burning something that's 100% cotton. I do that with my fabrics to test to see if there's any polyester in my fabrics if I'm unsure of the content. So I'm, it's just what is it that you want? I mean the baby skin can burn if you use polyester and then if you also use the 100% cotton at least the so that's the one that I use the most is the polyester. Whereas if you use the cotton, then it's going to burn completely because there is no stoppage barrier there. And so the baby's going to be on fire anyway because the quilt or that's made with the cotton fabric and the cotton batting is going to catch on fire anyway. So I say do whatever you feel. I do. I did notice that a lot of people are using the green bat in baby quilts now. It's actually recycled using plastic. 
So I don't know about that because I haven't used that, but that is what's in the industry. And some people have said that there is a flame retardant batting. I don't know anything about that. But just keep in mind that you're still using 100% cotton fabrics on most of these quilts as well. So you're still going to have some cotton. And I do notice that when I buy novelty prints and they're 100% cotton, it's written on the salvage that these items should not be used for children's sleepwear. So it will be the same difference as making a quilt 100% cotton. Is that not made for quilt wear? The question came up on the camera... The question came up on the chat about what to use in a denim quilt. And when I do a denim quilt, I tend not to put a batting in my denim quilts. Even if they're a rag quilt, I instead will opt to use flannel on the back. Just because it gets so heavy and bulky that you want to not use a batting there. You could, if you don't want to use flannel, you can use one of the minkies cuddle fabric a fleece or something like that as well but you don't need three layers if you're working with denim it's pretty heavy and sturdy and i think that is it for the quilt batting section so i am going to now start talking about the quilting gill So yeah, on the quilting gill, I'm sure I'm not going to remember everything that was said in the chat box, but I did write down a few things that were pros for me for quilt gill, and then I have a couple of things that could be a con, but ways to work around them. The one main reason for me for joining a gill is that you're around like-minded people. When you have your friends and family come around that are not crafty, people they don't understand us they don't understand why we would buy perfectly good fabric cut it up and then sew it back together so even when you're talking about different coloring or if you feel like you've done something that was outside the norm of your normal expertise or you learned something different and you go and explain it and you're all excited and they go okay yeah it's cute you know they just don't get it whereas a quilter actually gets that if you did a Dresden plate, or if you did a New York beauty quilt, they understand the technique that you had to go to go through to get to that point. The next thing is sharing your work and then also seeing the work of others because when you come to a quilt gill, again, they understand fully what it was that you did to do that. And even if it's your first quilt, your beginner quilt, or you go up and you say, hi, my name is so-and-so, and this is my first quilt. It can be nine patches, four patches. It can be um, a panel quilt. They wouldn't care. They're going to clap and give you kudos for getting that project done. So that's another reason. And then you also get to see their work. So you can see what's going on in your quilt industry as well as what's going on in your particular area. Next, Quilt Gills sponsor classes. Most times, Gills will have classes. And then for the members of that Gill, it would be a cheaper fee than if someone who's a non-member of the Gill attend that class. And the next best thing about that is if they have enough beginners or people needing a particular topic you can get more focused training it's also another way of learning more about the gill members and i'm going to talk about that in a minute when you do breakout sessions the gill also some gills also have book library so if you don't have a lot of funds and or don't want to store books in your home it's a great way for you to borrow a book if you only want to make a pattern or two out of a book then you can borrow it for a month and bring it back some gills my gill actually will charge you a dollar fee if you're late bringing it bringing it back on time but other than that it doesn't cost anything to use it as long as you're a member if you are a visitor or a guest you cannot check out any books next is a quilt show we go to a lot of art museums and we see all the beautiful work of art and our family doesn't 
fully understand that our quilting is also a work of art. So one of the things I like about the quilt show is they organize this quilt show with your help, of course, but when you actually get stuff hung on professional standards, you know, things start to look a little different. You have better lighting than what we have every day in our normal homes. We have better lighting than what we have at our normal quilt gills. So when we have this show, it's just fantastic to see all of these three to 400 pieces of works and art. And I've done a lot of videos on the quilt retreats and you all seem to like those, but your work can be showed. We go from beginner to the more advanced. Everyone's work that's in the gill, every gill member's work is included in the show. No one is excluded. Another thing about gills is that they will stretch your level of creativity. They have a lot of quilt challenges. So say you've never paper pieced before and someone has a challenge to make a paper piecing quilt. They could tell you that the quilt needs to be in particular colors or it could be in particular sizes. And maybe those are things that you haven't worked with before. And it's just a good way to stretch yourself. You don't have to participate in this, but it's very nice and fun thing to do when you do, even if you don't win because it got you being creative. Another thing on quilt retreat, I mean on a quilting gill is actually retreats and I just talked about that. Most gills will go on a retreat at least once a year and the benefits of the quilting retreat is that you can go and have a dedicated weekend or whatever designated amount of time they schedule where you have to do nothing but sew. It's not like you're at home and someone can call you and say can you come pick me up from over here or making dinner or answering you know the generic telephone calls all of that seems to cease when you're at retreat because your family know that you're away and you're unavailable for that period of time now when you go on the quilt retreat you do not have to sew the entire time you can go to bed whenever you want the last person in the room actually locks up the place so that everybody's belongings are secured but you don't you can socialize with everybody we have you know, we eat, have meals provided some form of way, whether it be with the place or we're bringing our own or using crock pot meals. So it just depends on what's going on. But retreats are very nice. And then you're actually sewing with like-minded people again. And then you're also able to see what other people are working on. Sometimes the retreats will have a particular set of projects for you to do but those projects normally don't take the entire retreat time and I did a video on what to take to a retreat so I will also link it so that you will know about that there were some other things that was mentioned about the pros of a quilting guild and I just can't remember them all I know that we have optional block at our guild and I can't think I can't think of the other pros. So if you do want to just try to stay with the uh, live video, I would recommend that some of the cons with working with the when going to a quilt gill is that as a new member or a new person attending a gill member, some of the things that can be con. <laughs> Some of the things that could be cons when you're going to a gill is you as a new person walking in and you don't know what's going on. If you've never been to this meeting, if you don't have any friends already in this gill, it can be overwhelming. Now, what our gill did, did this year, because it can be, it can appear to be unfriendly if people come in and nobody talks to them because most guild members are just flying around they know what the different stations are and so they're enjoying themselves having a good time and they're socializing they're not actively paying attention that they have a new member we really don't know we have a new member until we do our business meeting which is after the break and so then you of course get a warm welcome but nobody know particularly that you are a new member so what our guild has instituted is that we try now to have a seasoned quilter assigned with a newbie and that person will walk a new person around to each station, explain various things about our guild. And I think it was even suggested in the comment section to give them 
something, a flyer, a business card with information about when the guild meets, some of the things that the guild is involved in, and so forth. And so that way that a new person will not feel like nobody was friendly, that those people were rude. It's just because it's a lot going on. When you go into the breakout sessions, like if they have a hand sewing night or if they have any kind of classes, that's when you actually get to meet a lot of people. And that's another reason to actually go on the retreat. And I do remember one of the cons for being in a quilt guild is that they do a lot of charity work and with quilts of valor most guilds have some connection to quilts of valor groups around and there's also other charities that we do things for we do the pillowcases we do kennel quilts we do twin size quilts we do quilts for veterans we do all sorts of charity quilts through our guilds so that's another con now one other thing when going to a guild is that you know you are in a group with majority of women and so you have everybody that's kind of have their own personalities and sometimes women we can rub each other the wrong way every now and then but you know you need to figure out how to maneuver around in a gill so that it benefits you but not let somebody run you out of something that you want to be involved in i'm not saying that there's controversy in all gills Every gill is different, so I would recommend that you look for look in your area. You can search quilting gills and put your state, and then there's a list that comes up that you can pick your state, and then you can see which gills are close to your home, and then pick one to go or pick a few to go to, and then you can decide which guild it is that you want to join. I actually joined the guild that was closest to my home because I figured I would have more of a chance of getting there. So you need to determine that for yourself. So I'm going to go ahead and end here. I'm sure that I left out a lot of information that was included in our live chat. And again, I apologize for the volume on that. I'm praying that this next Wednesday we will have adequate volume. So I will see you. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you.